overall, I've been really blessed and fortunate. You know, I try not to take that for granted, and I try to work hard and you know not lo lose my love. But not everything works, but it's the attempt that counts. And once in a while, everything comes together. I'm John Turturro, and this is a timeline of my career. Thanks for the seats. Hey, what's up? Hey, nothing. I got trouble with these fucking ridge balls downstairs. They got me crazy. Oh, fuck, how you doing? Raging Bull is the first time I was ever on screen. I auditioned for the movie with my good friend Michael Bartolucco. I brought uh, pastries to my interview because I thought to be polite. They didn't have a script, and we had adapted a scene from the book of Raging Bull, because I had read it when I was a kid. My father was an amateur prize fighter, and so we had worked on it, and Martin Scorsese was very nervous about, because, well, there's no script, and Robert De Niro said, let, let them do it, and we moved the furniture around, and my friend Michael Bataluco and I, we, we did this scene, which we had adapted ourselves. I think they were sort of taken by our naivete or audacity. I mean, really, they were giant heroes, and. There's still people who have inspired me and my good friend Michael for a long time. Let me explain myself. They're, they're not really black. I'm, I mean, they're black, but they're not really black. They're, they're more than black. It's, it's, it's different. It's different? Yeah, to me, it's, it's different. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Laugh if you want to. You know, your hair is kinkier than mine. What does that mean? Do, do the Right Thing, which was in 1988, we shot it. And then it came out in 89. And to a lot of heated, advanced press. When the movie was about to come out, I was, I was thinking, wow, I wonder what the reaction is going to be to me on the subways. Joe Klein wrote in New York Magazine that he thought there were going to be riots in the movie theaters. And a few other critics did too that it was like kind of out of control. None of that ever happened. None of it was ever retracted. I've only been embraced by the black community for that film and other films too. This lady was in craft service. She wouldn't give me water. She told me on the set, she said, because she had seen on a big screen at LIU me saying all this, not one time. I remember her saying to me, uh, I hate you. I hate you so much. And I was like, the right thing came, came out of because I did a film, Five Corners, with John Patrick Shanley, which was before that. And then Spike saw me in that. And then he sent me Do the Right Thing in a leather-bound script from Studio Duplicating, which used to, because he would write the script and then they'd type it up for you. Beautiful paper and really great typesetting. Remember I was doing a film with Dennis Hopper in Venice Beach, and I remember I received the script and I read it. And then when I came, and I liked it, uh, I came back and uh, we met. Spike and I are born three weeks apart, same year. I grew up in a black neighborhood. He grew up in an Italian neighborhood. We were sort of faded. And he asked me what part I wanted to play. And I said, I'd like to play uh, the racist guy. Because I thought that was what it was about. Yeah, we, we, I mean, I've done some really big roles and a bunch of cameos for him because he likes me to, I don't know, good luck charm or something. It's nice to have some continuity because there are many people I've worked with over the years, which I would have loved to have had a return engagement. But when Spike's movies, I've played, you know, kind of a racist guy. Uh, on Jungle Fever, I played the complete opposite. A guy who was really open-minded and very sweet. I played a cop and clockers. I played club owner with my brother Nicholas in the Mo Better Blues. You know, sometimes I like playing really quiet characters, like I played in The Truce, when I played Primo Levi, and sometimes I've played explosive characters. And But I love characters that are complex and even in a dramatic thing, a role, that there's irony and there's humor. I don't like when something is just one thing. I'm not interested because no one, none of us, are one thing. Plateaued. What, what kind of word is that? What, plateaued? Plateaued. 
I told, uh, it's, well, it's like, uh, you... You mean like people you, don't like me anymore? No, 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 it's not you per se, it's just... Maybe I should get my teeth cut. No, it's, it's the nature of the show. They've already seen you win, and they want something new. Well, Quiz Show, it was based on real people, so I had all the kinescope of Herb. I also met Herb Stemple. I watched him a lot. I had a lot of time to prepare, talk to Robert Redford. The way he talked and his voice, everything I based on Herb. I used to warm my voice up. He had a very, very high voice. He talked very, in a very specific way. Uh, I can't really do it right now. But he had a very, very specific way of talking. So I was fascinated when I first heard him talk. I was like, wow. I never heard any, saw anybody like him. Probably one of my most unattractive roles. I was fat, I had my teeth discolored, my hair thin, the glasses, and you know, people would come on the set and they would sometimes talk to Robert and they'd say, wow, John's gotten a little heavy. You know, they, they never thought I did it on purpose. I've won some awards and things and been nominated. You know, it's nice to be invited to the party, but I think overall what you do is how the film lives on and how it reaches people. Because a lot of films that have reached people in a deep way, that have won no awards at all, and were never acknowledged. Some of it has to do with timing. And like, as Marlon Brando said, sometimes the best acting is the least appreciated. Let me tell you something, Pandeo. You pull any of your crazy shit with us, you flash a piece out on the lanes. I'll take it away from you and stick it up your ass and pull the fucking trigger till it goes click. Jesus. You said it, man. Nobody fucks with the Jesus. Jesus Quintana from The Big Lebowski is inspired by a character I did in a play 10 years before. It's inspired and it's kind of based on one guy and a little bit of another guy. When you really like people, you want to surprise them. And they're your friends, but you also want to like, you want to bring something that they haven't thought of. So I looked at everything and I showed Joel and Ethan certain things that I, once I had that outfit on that I, I could do. Cause you know, you, when you only have five minutes, you've got to put everything in. I wanted the nail, I think, they had the outfit, I played athletics, but I trained, as, I've done a lot of dancing. The whole dance that I did, it was like a Muhammad Ali dance, you know. And I didn't know what song they were gonna use, they were gonna do in slow motion, but, but I just kept trying to come up with things to make them laugh. So my mom was a dressmaker, and so you wear a suit, you move differently. You wear a dress, you move differently. You wear a tight pantsuit like that, and then they wanted me to be specially well endowed, they were like, I was, that, that was their idea, that wasn't mine. And I was like, oh God, it was a little embarrassing, but then you had to get into it. And I was like, and I was very thin because I had done this movie where I played Primo Levi and I had lost all this weight and people thought I was dying and stuff and I couldn't put it back on. So I was very, very, very thin. So I just wanted to make it as memorable. And I didn't think they were gonna use all of that. And then when they showed me the cut of it, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed first time I saw it. I was laughing, but I was embarrassed. I was like, oh God, I can't believe I did all those things. I'm talking to Julianne Moore about this, that sometimes I think the more normal people are, or the more grounded, the, the crazier you can be in your work. I mean, I also was with you know a great company with Jeff and John and Steve. Let's face it, I mean, you talk about awards, like, yeah, Jeff's done a lot of great performances. You know how many awards Jeff Bridges won for The Big Basketball? Zero. And that is a character that we talk about as if he's our friend or our therapist or a philosopher. Let's be honest here. That's a great, great, great performance. And John is great and Steve is great. But Jeff's performance is, there is something yoga-like about it or zen-like. Because Jeff has something really beautiful about him as a performer. He's very, Selfless. There's the Oscars and there should be the dudes. The right. dude awards. The dudesters. I, I would rather get a dude, like you, you get a dude. A dude award. I, I love the character. It's a great character. It don't matter to Jesus. You know what I mean? That's right, man. It don't matter to him, man. He's the greatest. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Rush to judgment the game. Rushed. There's two other guys. There's Dwayne Reed. You can't deny that. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
Night of we, we shot that in 2016. It feels like we shot it for three years. But I think th those mini series things, when I've, I've done Billy Martin for The Bronx is Burning, those are long, great experiences because you can do different things than you can do in a film because there's more scenes. And sometimes it can be a repetitive scene. That can be the problem when it's eight hours. You try to find as much variation, but you get to explore sometimes elements that maybe you wouldn't do in a two or three hour, two and a half hour movie. I saw the pilot, it was, it was very long. Uh, Jimmy Gandolfini was my friend, he did one day on it. I didn't want to watch it, so I had read the first couple episodes, I thought they were really good. I watched it with my eyes closed and then Jimmy didn't do that much, so I was like, okay, I don't have to kind of erase that from my mind. By then, they had written everything, because originally when they did the pilot, I think they, just had that and maybe one other episode they were working on. So I read the whole thing. I could see how well written it was. A man who's completely full of flaws, you know, and you just see a lot of humanity and a person probably with great potential, but didn't have the stomach to be ambitious. I had a lot of time, go to court, talk to lawyers, and study the script. My days were very long, but I, I loved doing it. You know, with Riz, it was a natural, we just liked each other. And so he would come to me and talk to me and ask me and sometimes was able to help him as much as I could. A lot of people helped me and I took parts from all different people. It's a character I would love to revisit because it was such a long shoot. I got lost in it. That's what you hope for. I really need you to listen to me. I do. How could you be so rude, Arnold? For what? I was introducing you to my family. I brought you to my son's birthday party, you and you had the nerve you would have done to just the same disappear? Thing. It wasn't an easy situation. Really? I searched for your eyes again and again. I didn't exist. We were in love. Oh, please. We were in love. He didn't How many he times was, did he, he have wrong. to say that? He was, he was, he... It made me sick. I threw up. I don't know how you could do something like that to me. Gloria Bell in 2018 with Julianne Moore and directed by Sebastian Lalo. He's a very cute guy, I have to say. I mean, I'm not in the market for a guy, but he's such a cute guy. <laughs> he's hard not to have a crush on. You know when you work with him? Because he's such a, I don't know, maybe because he's Latin or something, I just, he has such an inviting manner. I, I really, I'd, lo I'd love to work with him again. You know, love stories are complicated. So she has her flaws too, but she's, She's really trying more than probably Arnold is, but you know, when you're a certain age and then you, you meet the other first wife or husband and say, we were in love and we loved you and all these things, and you're the outsider and there's parts of you that are not developed. And I thought it was a, a lovely story and I was resistant because the guy keeps disappearing, but Sebastian said to me, the thing he loves about the character was that he keeps trying. And I guess there are lots of men and maybe some women too, who don't have the, the fortitude or the courage or the confidence to get out of a terrible relationship, a dysfunctional relationship, and maybe out of guilt or whatever, and instead embrace a great opportunity that they have. I know this is something that I think occurred to Sebastian's mom, who he was able to understand it from her point of view. So I thought I will follow along and he was very helpful that way. And she's great to work with. I think at the end you realize you have to fail, but you have to keep failing better. You have to keep trying. Failure is part of it. And I think he's grappling with that. My motivation is to keep doing things that I haven't done before and challenging myself. And it's also who I'm doing it with. You know, it's not just if it's successful, it's the experience of who you do it with that counts. And I, I value that, you know, more and more.